Hi. Um, welcome to our 2018 Census Technical Seminar. It's great to have you along today. I'm Cathy Connolly. I'm the GM Census here at StatsNZ. Uh, I am relatively new to the Census, but I am a career statistician, so not new to Statistics New Zealand or to the delivery of statistics. Um, they won't be on screen, but they will be shortly. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my co-presenters. The firstly is Christine Bycroft, who is one of our principal statisticians and a true census expert. Christine has been the technical lead on our census transformation and her leadership has been integral in developing the methods that we're going to talk you through today. Christine's expertise is also well recognised internationally. The other person in our presentation team today is Adele Quinn, who is our manager of our data analytics team. Adele has a wealth of experience having worked in censuses in various roles since 1996. I did get permission to say 1996. Um, so as well as stints on census transformation on, in our population statistics area and supporting the Electro Electoral Representation Commission twice. So as I said, it is great to finally be talking to you all. I know that some of you will have been frustrated to not have heard from us before now, um, but we have been very busy working through the methods to fill the gaps left by the lower response to the 2018 census. Hopefully, most of you will have caught up with our media release on Monday, when our government statistician announced that we've now created a data set that meets Statistics New Zealand's quality criteria for population structure information. Over the next hour and a half or so, we will run through some of the more detailed information about the methods that we've developed. So what are you going to see? Um, I'm going to do a really quick update, including where we're at with the first release. And then I'm going to hand over to Christine, who will take the bulk of the seminar and will run through the methods and why you can believe that we, what we've done has improved the census data set. Adele will take us through the quality work that we're doing and then I'll finish off with what's happening with 2023 and where to from there. We are happy to take questions at the end and we'll try and leave um, a good portion of time for that. So you can just send your questions through as you go. If you are needing clarification during the presentation, feel free to submit a question and our team will attempt to answer it if they can. So, where are we at? Before we get into the detail of our new methods, I just want to acknowledge that 2018 didn't go to plan. While some things worked well and as planned, we know that other things didn't. We didn't make it easy enough for everyone to respond. Mail out didn't work for everyone and the process of getting paper forms could be frustrating. And not seeing face to face people did not sit well with some New Zealanders. While we're being careful not to preempt the finding of an independent review of the census operation, we know that some themes are emerging in feedback and comment about the 2018 operation. Certainly for some areas, not being uh, contacted early enough, either in getting people what they needed to complete the census, or in making contact with them uh, in follow-up is something that we're very aware of. Um, we do understand that the length of time after people were made contact with after Census Day um, did have a, a big impact on the number of people that responded. And I'm sure the independent review will identify other areas that can be improved for the next census. Over the past nine months or so, we've been very busy developing and implementing the methods that we're going to talk you through today. This has been made possible by the work that we've been doing over the last four or so years on our longer term goal to move to an administrative based census supported by surveying. We've also worked with our international colleagues at uh, national statistical offices around the world, leveraging off methods that they have developed and their expertise to provide input and review to our own work. Our key goal today is that you I think walk away, <laughs> um, with an understanding of the methods that we're using to fill the gaps and what we know about their impact. We want to leave you confident that we will be transparent about the sources of data used for each variable and the quality of the variables. Our work is, however, still underway, so much of the detail of the information about the variables we're sharing today 
is not finalised, so please do treat it as indicative. We know that some of you will have specific interests in particular topics, but I'm afraid we won't be able to answer detailed questions on, about specific variables as we are still evaluating. I mentioned the independent review um, earlier, and this is an, a really important um, thing for us. One of the things that we do know is that we need to get a very clear understanding of what worked and what didn't work for 2018. Liz McPherson, our government statistician, is seeking robust independent advice and has asked Murray Jack, who's a management consultant, and Connie Gradazio, who is a um, ex-deputy head of, at the um, Stats, Stats Canada um, and has run a number of censuses to consider the design, implementation and operation of the census. And this review is on track to be um, released uh, by July. Another very important mechanism that we've got to help us is our external data quality panel. So they've, we've pulled together this panel um, of experts to provide both advice on methodology as we've developed it and to provide an independent view of the data quality on the census data set which will be released at the same time that we're, we release the data. So um, the 23rd of September is when you can expect the data and this will include uh, usually resident population counts uh, down to an SA2 level, so that's the sort of new equivalent of an area unit. Uh, it'll also include the number of general and Māori electorates and the general and Māori electoral population counts. We're planning on having customised data uh, available shortly after the first release and we'll update customers uh, with a more definitive date once we know. We are certainly very happy to take early requests. Um, as is usual, subsequent releases for the census will flow through to June 2020. Um, and our population estimates, um, both the census coverage estimate from the post enumeration survey and the um, estimated resident population will be released by March 2020 and then demographic projections will flow through to mid-2020. I'm now going to hand over to Christine Bycroft who will talk you through our methods. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction for some, about some concepts. Um, most of the focus of today is on the methods about how we added administrative records to the census file. It will probably take around 40 minutes, 45 minutes to go through that. And then we'll talk about where the information about the variables, the characteristics comes from and that will take perhaps another 30 minutes. So I just want to start with some context from a rights-based perspective. So we have a right to privacy as laid out in the principles in the Privacy Act. And we have a right to live in an informed society. And official statistics plays a crucial role in providing the public with information that they can trust. And the census is especially important in providing a picture of society, a key underpinning of our democracy. There is a natural tension between privacy and providing information that is collected directly from individuals. This tension has already been carefully considered when we develop the census content and questionnaire, as it is for all Stats New Zealand surveys. The use of administrative data respects that same balance between census content and the public good that comes from living in an informed society. Stats New Zealand's role is supported by legislation through the Statistics Act, which is compatible with the Privacy Act. The primary reason for this is that the Statistics Act requires that the same level of confidentiality is applied to statistics or research as the Privacy Act requires. Many of the principles of the Privacy Act, such as those related to the purpose of collection, contain exemptions for when information is used for statistical or research purposes. The Treaty of Waitangi provides a unique statement of human rights which includes universal human rights for all New Zealanders, such as privacy. The treaty also specifically acknowledges indigenous rights. So here I want to also acknowledge that we're still learning and evolving our understanding of Maori data sovereignty and its application and what privacy means from a Maori perspective. Part of this evolution 
is developing better governance from a te ao Māori perspective and better processes in respect of tikanga Māori to support our decisions about data at an operational level. So first of all, what is a census? The tagline is that census aims to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. By doing this, census is able to produce very detailed statistics for small areas and small population groups. And the census provides demographic counts, social and economic characteristics for people, for dwellings, and for households and families. Today we're going to concentrate on the people aspect. We won't be including any information about dwellings and uh, we won't be providing information about households and families. Oops. One of the interesting things about census taking is, is how it's been evolving over the last decade or so across the world. What used to be the traditional census, um, where everybody was asked to fill in a form, uh, is now called a full field enumeration census. And this is what we set out to do in 2018. In some countries, uh, particularly led by the Nordic countries, they've introduced what they call a register-based census, where they only use administrative or register sources that they have available. In between, some countries have combined those two approaches. So their census is a mix of administrative sources and field collection. And in fact, this is what we've ended up doing in New Zealand in 2018. It wasn't what we planned to do, but we, what we were producing is actually a combined census. So a technical term now, coverage, and which is about how many people the census should count. The census aims to count people who are in New Zealand on census night. So people who live in New Zealand but are temporarily overseas on census night are not part of the census population. And what census actually counts is in its census count and the difference we call the net census undercount. This is estimated by the post enumeration survey or our, we call it PES and clearly we haven't run that yet so for 2018 we don't know what the actual population should be but we have that for previous censuses. And when we uh, count, our census count has been made up of responses from census forms and also we count some non-respondents to the census. What we've done in 2013 in previous censuses uh, is have a census data set that looks rather like this. Uh, so most of the people counts are made up of real people that we counted through the census forms, but we also have some what we call unit imputation. It's a statistical process that counts people where we have enough information uh, that they should have been counted, but they didn't fill in a form. And the characteristics of people, uh, if they filled in census forms, then we have census responses. There's a little bit of item imputation, so a statistical uh, estimate of what a value should have been, but most variables are missing in 2013 and previous census data sets if they, a person didn't answer the form. For an imputed record, um, there's a little bit of item imputation for age and sex and usual residence, and otherwise the variables are missing. So that's what people have been used to seeing in their, 20, in their census data set. 2018 is going to be different in a couple of key wa ways. We still have the census forms, and that's how most people are counted, but there is no unit imputation. Uh, we will be using administrative sources to count people that we don't have census forms for. So that's the big difference. We also have a different approach to uh, filling in missing information. And we had planned to do this um, because uh, we wanted to um, improve the census uh, outputs. So we will be using historic census data, so looking back at the 2013 census, using administrative sources and a wider um, extent of item imputation for the characteristics that are missing. Uh, there's labels missing from this graph, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, we don't know the true population 
uh, in 2018, but when we've been doing our work and developing our methods, we, we needed to have a reasonable idea about what the population actually was. So we have four different benchmark populations. The top one on the left-hand side is our 2013 estimated resident, resident population that's been brought forward. That's, that's what people have been using for their uh, official statistics on population. The next one to that with the red circle is a new estimate that we've been developing based on a new migration measure. So rather than uh, using people's intentions to say how long they have, uh, how long they intend to stay or leave the country, uh, the new migration methods are using um, actual measures of length of stay in New Zealand. And you can see that there's been uh, some reduction in the population size due to that. The other circled uh, label there is called DSE, which is short for Dual System Estimation. That's a methodology that's used to uh, estimate who's missing from a population when you combine two sources. It's the methodology that's used for uh, the PES when we match that to the census. But here, rather than matching the PES coverage survey to the census, we're matching our administrative population. So that DSC is a, in a new and innovative um, way of estimating the population combining census responses and administrative uh, data set, which we'll talk to you about in a minute. So the good thing is that um, while the, the DSC and the new 2013-based uh, ERP are completely independent um, methods for producing a population count, they've actually come out very, very close. So these are the numbers that we're going to show you today. Uh, they relate back to the release that our government statistician provided last week. So at the top is what we aim to count, our best estimate given the information that we have to date, uh, that we expect there is around 4,760,000 people in New Zealand. From the census forms, we are counting 4,175,000 people, which are made up of nearly 4 million people who were provided individual forms, and another 200,000 people who are listed on a household form, uh, but we don't have the full individual information for them. And over 500,000 people are being counted from administrative sources. So a census file is made up of 89% of people from in census forms and 11% of people from at these administrative enumerations. So the administrative data is playing a really important role in our 2018 census data set. Now the difference between what we've achieved in that census count, so 4,700,000, and what we think is, uh, is about what we expect is 58,000 or 1.2%. So that's an indicative coverage gap for 2018. And we can compare that to the undercount in 2013, which was a 2.4% net census undercount, plus or minus half a percent. So this, uh, I'm going to step quite slowly through how we've added administrative records to the census file. I'm going to start by explaining the administrative data sources themselves, then talk about the methods, um, the framework that we've used to combine census forms and administrative data, and then give you some uh, rather interesting uh, patterns um, that we've used to assess where we've got to. So where does the admin data come from? Well, basically it comes from Stats New Zealand's Integrated Data Infrastructure, or the IDI. This is a, a research database where data from across many different sources across government have been linked together. It also includes Stats New Zealand's household surveys and the 2013 census. It's a structured data set, so uh, those blue uh, data sources are, around the outside are all linked to what we call the IDI spine. The IDI spine is a big long list of people. There's around 10 million uh, records in the IDI spine. It's trying to represent people who've ever lived in New Zealand. And we've taken a demographic approach to build that spine. So you can see the circle on the left-hand side. 
So people enter the New Zealand population because they were born here. So we have birth registrations from 1920. People can also enter the population on a visa if migrants come to live here. And we have uh, electronic records for visa applications since 1997. There are still some gaps from those two data sources. And we use tax registrations uh, for people that won't be included in either of those ways. And we get what appears to be a very complete record or list of people who've ever been living in New Zealand. And that means that when we link other data sources to them, most of those people in the data sources are in that spine. But the spine is uh, not very helpful if you want to know who's been living, who's living in New Zealand at a given point in time. And to do that, uh, we've been developing in our census transformation work what we've called an, an IDI, estimated resident population. So it's an administrative population using the linked admin data in the IDI. So we start with people in the IDI spine, and then we include people who have had some activity in administrative data sources. So have you paid tax? Have they been to the doctor, uh, enrolled in education, have an ACC claim? If that's happened within the last two years, then you're likely to, to be living in New Zealand. Of course, we want a, a population at a particular point in time. So we take out people who may have died before that date or those who have migrated overseas before that reference date. That's, so that's in general how we do this. That admin population is available in the IDI uh, for June the 30th each year. For our 2018 census application, we're using what's known as the September 2018 refresh in the IDI. And I just want to talk through a few points about why uh, that's, that's a good administrative uh, population for us to use. First of all, the data sources that we are using from the spine mean that we're very sure that we have real people being included. So birth registrations, tax registrations and visa applications, they're all high integrity data sources that we can trust. Uh, the deaths are able to be removed because we have death registrations from DIA and we are able to link to the external migration records to take out people who've left the country. We've also linked the 2018 census to the IDI spine. And the circled uh, data sources in red are particularly important for um, the activity indicators, but also for obtaining address ID, which we use for our geographic location and ethnic variables. We know a lot about the IDI ERT population. We've been looking at it for a while. And it is a good approximation of the New Zealand resident population. We've done detailed examination of time series from 2006 to 2016, comparing that administrative population against the official statistics, looking at details by age and sex, geographies and ethnicity. Uh, there's a link there if you'd like to see that. There's papers and the actual data series to explore. I've just put up uh, the graph there that shows the comparison between the IDI ERP in 2013 and the uh, official resident population. And you can see that they map pretty closely. There's little gaps for the males in the younger adult ages, which we'll see again. So those are the strengths of the IDI ERP. But we're also well aware of the limitations of our admin population. We know that it doesn't meet all the accuracy requirements for producing official statistics. And most of our methodology that we're using uh, to, to use the administrative data are about managing the limitations that we're aware of. So we know that the uh, admin population does not include everybody. Some people are missed. And it will include some people who shouldn't be there. There are some marked differences in the age sex structure for younger adults, especially males, that you could see in the previous picture. The geographic location is very important for census. And from the administrative data, the address information is good for larger geographies, such as territorial authority and Auckland local, local boards, but the accuracy does decrease at smaller geographies. 
And when we try to place administrative people into a household, this is where we have real problems. Around half of the administrative households that we've created, um, and when we compare them with the 2013 census, about half of them have the same household membership as the census. So that's the administrative data sources. What did we do with them? So I have some pictures now, some colour-coded pictures. So in the 2013 census, our census data set was made up of individual forms, those dark green ones there. Uh, that was 95% of the file. There was 1% of people listed on the household and 4% from unit imputation. We had age, sex and place for everybody in the census data set and some missing data that's represented by those white squares and spaces. In the 2013 census, again, we have uh, census forms, individual forms or people listed on a household form. Again, the patterns of missing data if people didn't answer questions or if we don't have a full questionnaire. But what else we have in 2018 census is this administrative data population. So the admin population is bigger than the census, quite a lot bigger. Um, it does have some variables um, with some uh, systematic gaps in, ca in some cases because not everybody has the variables available. And then a number of variables where there is no information from alternative sources. So we have two sets of um, data, each with their own um, unique patterns of missing data. And we want to combine those. To combine them, we match them together. And what we're looking to do is to use people in that blue sliver on the slide. So some people in the administrative population who haven't been included in the census. And when we've done that, our census data set looks like this. <laughs> so we have people in the census forms. Um, some of the information has been filled in from administrative data or the previous census. That's the bright blue and dark green boxes that have been filled in. I think we have a problem with the slide here. I oh, know, there we go. Uh, the administrative records have been used to add people to the census file and they are now bright blue. For the 2013 census, administrative data fill the variable gaps. Um, but people that we don't have a census form for, whether that's because they're on the household listing or because it's an administrative record, uh, then the 2013 census and administrative sources are the main sources of variables. So that's the picture of your census data set. So now how did we do that? This is um, starting to get onto the methodological framework now. Uh, so first of all, we want to add those admin people to the census file, so enumerate people who should be counted as part of the census but who don't have a response for. The second step is that we put people in private dwellings where we can. As you saw before, the administrative household's quality is not so great, and we will put people in private dwellings where we have good evidence that we're improving households. Otherwise, these administrative records will be placed in a mesh block. We do that when we are sure the person should be counted, and we have good evidence for improving small area information. Now that's another big change in the 2018 census. In previous censuses, all the census records were in dwellings. Here we have people who are placed not in a dwelling, but given a mesh block where they usually live. So a little bit more detail about each of those steps. First of all, who's the, what's the eligible administrative population? So we're starting with our IDI ERP, that's people who live in New Zealand. But we have to take out people who are resident, residents who are temporarily overseas on census night. And we can do that because we have links to the border movements data. Then we link the 2018 census to the IDI spine so that we know who has already responded to the census. We don't want to count them twice. So we have a match rate of nearly 98%, so that gives us a very good basis for knowing um, who's already responded to the census and who hasn't. We've also estimated the linkage error in that. It's a probabilistic linking, so there always is a little bit of link error. 
So we've missed uh, an estimated 1.4% of links and there's a less than 1% incorrect links. So that gives us a very good basis for identifying the people in that blue sliver. Then we want to put them into households where, we've got, where we are improving households. The census dwelling frame here gives us a, uh, a good list of all the dwellings and we know from the census field work which dwellings, which private dwellings have not responded to the census, where we don't have any census forms for them. So for those non-responding dwellings, we use a statistical model, it's a logistic regression model, or two in fact, to predict which non-responding households we can create good households for. There's a trade-off here um, between getting strictly the right people into the household and getting the right types of households. We look, we've looked at the patterns of numbers of adults and children. The picture there uh, shows you the two models that we're using. There's one that predicts uh, whether the person is likely to be in the, at the right address in the admin data, that's on the horizontal axis. On the vertical, vertical axis, we have another model which predicts how likely the household is to include the right membership. So the probabilities are on the axes. And we need to set our red line somewhere, and those above the red line will be included in uh, dwellings. There'll be administrative dwellings administrative households, sorry, and the others will not be included in the households. So we've made a judgment call and we've set that threshold at the point where the households have a 50% chance or better of having exactly the same people or the same household type. The next step is what we do with the rest of the people in our administrative population who aren't already in the census. So we are going to put them in mesh blocks. Uh, we now have to do a little bit more work to make sure that the person should be counted. So there are two steps there. We need to remove over coverage uh, in the uh, admin population. So we actually take out about 120,000 people because they are likely to be incorrectly included. And we also make a small adjustment for missing linkages, that 1.4% so that we're not counting people twice. Again, we use a statistical model for the remaining people to predict, predict, predict which people are more likely to have a correct mesh block. So again, this is the, it's a logistic regression model. It's actually the same as predicting whether the person is at the correct address but applied for a mesh block. And that's the pattern of uh, distribution that you can see there. Now there's a trade-off here, it's a little bit different from the previous one. We now have administrative records who we know should be part of the New Zealand resident population and they haven't answered the census. So every record that we include will improve the national demographic distributions. However, we also know that um, the, the, the mesh block may not be right. So we have a trade-off between improving national demographic distributions and trying to provide good even coverage patterns for small geographies. We want to avoid putting people, too many people in a small geography, but we also want to make sure that we don't have small geographies which are really still undercounted. So again, we've made another judgment call and we've set a threshold of 50% chance or better of being in the correct mesh block. So that's as far as I'm going to go into the statistical methodology. We will pr be producing uh, detailed documentation with all the full um, description of the models and so on. Uh, now, we're going to have a look at what, well, what happened after we did all that. So who have we added from the administrative sources? So a census file, we had uh, uh, that 4.175 million uh, census form respondents. And we've added 162,000 people from administrative sources and been able to place them directly into dwellings. And another 357,000 people who've been added to mesh blocks. And we had another 68,000 people left over that we didn't include because we didn't think that their mesh block was likely to be good enough. 
Now this is a slightly complicated picture. It's showing the age distribution by source group for males. On the right hand side uh, are the colour coding for the different groups. So in blue we have the age distribution of census respondents. The red is people who are added to dwellings. And you can see that we have more children and uh, so probably their parents are being added to dwellings because typically uh, families with children are easier, have better household information in the administrative data. One of the interesting things here is the green line, the people that have been added to mesh blocks, and we can see that we're getting far more uh, sort of 25 to 35 odd um, young people, young, young adults, I'll say, <laughs> uh, added to mesh blocks. Um, but the purple line, the people that have been left out, are overwhelmingly in, in the age groups from 18 to 24. And that's driven by a model formulation because those groups, uh, people who've recently left home typically, uh, have poor administrative address information. Uh, that's the males. Uh, the female distribution is very similar, not quite such high peaks, but the same patterns. Now we're going to look at the ethnic distribution. Um, these are a little bit uh, complicated to follow, but again, it's the same source groups. If ethnic groups were missing evenly from the census, we would see even bars for each source that they come from. That's clearly not the case. And we can see here that Māori and Pacific were uh, not well enumerated through our census forms. The proportion in blue, the blue bar, is the proportion of Māori or Pacific who are in the census forms, the census respondents, and that's a lot lower than the people, the proportion of the people that we're bringing in through our administrative data. But the good thing is that we are bringing a lot of those people uh, into the administrative data. So the administrative data is really making a big difference for the people uh, who we know are typically difficult to count in a census. The next slides are the ethnic distributions for the remaining two uh, level one categories, so European and Asian. And for the European, you can see there's more Europeans in the census respondents and fewer being brought through, fewer proportionately being brought through in the administrative data. And similarly for the Asian ethnic group. This is a uh, picture of the age distribution, so it's single year of age along the bottom. The, the solid line is our dual system, dual system estimation estimate of the uh, population distribution for males by age. The yellow bars are our 2018 census file. So this is the census forms as well as the administrative records included. And you can see that the, uh, for the children and for most of the adult ages, the census is following very closely to what we think is the actual population that the census should be counting. So that's great news. There is still a gap for young adults and that's what we've seen in the previous slides as well, that we're not able to include the younger males in particular, but also younger women. So, and we're also able to compare that with 2013. The 2013 here is the blue bars, and it's the relative difference between the 2013 census counts and the official 2013 estimated resident population. We have adjusted here for the residents temporarily overseas. And again, uh, uh, the 2018 yellow bars are our comparison, approximate comparison against the 2018 dual system estimate. So the yellow bars are a lot shorter <laughs> than the blue bars. <laughs> Basically, that's saying that the census in 2018 has counted, included a lot more people across all age groups than the 2013 census was able to do. It's particularly good for children um, in comparison to 2013 census. 
you can see again those ages uh, so when young adults tend to leave home there's some improvement on 2018 but they are still the difficult area. There's a little bit of over coverage for the uh, oldest age groups that may be uh, an issue with the DSE estimate itself or some other reason we're not sure but the numbers are very small and these are percentages. And finally, uh, just look at the results comparing 2018 and 2013 across the territorial authorities and Auckland local boards. The point here is not to look at any particular um, territorial authority, but to note that the blue bars, this 2018 census, is quite a variable difference in coverage. The, some districts were up to 8% 8, 8 lower than that official estimated resident population. Um, some other districts where there was almost no difference and some were overcounted. You can see that the yellow bars for 2018, they are uniformly smaller, meaning that the undercount across all territorial authorities in the 2018 census is smaller than we were able to achieve in the 2013 census. And there's little very little over coverage in 2018 as well. We also uh, did some uh, analysis of what, would, what all of this meant for the electoral calculations and particularly we wanted to understand that mesh block threshold which is the main way that people are included or excluded from the 2018 census file, how does that affect our New Zealand electorates? We had a contractor come and do a sensitivity analysis and their conclusion was that the 2018 census is robust for the purposes of determining electoral boundaries and representation. So that also gave us confidence that the 2018 census data set is, is a really good one for our core uh, demographics. We have a number of other uh, core, uh, really important uses being examined by other groups at the moment, but those investigations are still underway. So in summary, the 2018 census population counts, the core demographics. Uh, we have a coherent statistical methodology for adding administrative records to the census file when we don't have a census form. It's based on statistical methodologies which reflect our understanding of the limitations of the administrative data. The administrative enumerations replace unit imputation and that is a significant quality improvement. We are adding real people, not statistical artefacts, um, and they do have some characteristics that come from alternative sources. And what we've seen as well is that the administrative data does include people who are hard to count in a census field enumeration. We are including people who did not respond to the 2013 census as well as the 2018 census. So we intend to continue with the, the use of administrative records in the census file and future censuses. So Stats New Zealand is now confident that we have compiled a census data set that will provide census usually resident population counts and electoral counts of acceptable quality. I've been uh, talking through how we've been adding administrative records to our census file, so adding people into the census file. Now I'm going to talk through where the characteristics of people come from uh, using alternative sources that we hadn't used in previous censuses. So I'll start with some background and uh, then look at our quality assessment of, qu of the alternative sources and then which variables use what sources. After that I'll be handing over to Adele to talk about our quality assessment process. So I think I mentioned already that we had already planned to improve census quality by filling in for missing answers to questions where possible using historical census data, linking through to the 2013 census responses, and administrative sources where that was possible, 
and also making greater use of imputation in the 2018 census. And that approach we've been able to naturally extend to their administrative enumerations. The same alternative sources are available for any census record from administrative data because it's all linked into the IDI. So just a reminder that the 2018 census data set is made up of those census forms and the administrative sources. And now we're going to look at the different sources that we're using. So first of all, we thought uh, we could use the 2013 census, go back to the previous answers that people gave for variables that didn't change a lot over time. We didn't have this information um, when we, when we decided to do this. So, but since then, we've been able to look at the consistency of responses for a person who responded in the 2013 census and the pers person's response in the 2018 census. These are the variables that we're using 2013 census data for. You can see at the top that very factual variables, country of birth and Maori descent that we use for electoral, which is either a yes or no response. There's 99% agreement between those two censuses. So people are very good at, at providing the same answer to very fact-based questions. There's another group of var variables where the consistency is greater than 90%, which is still quite high. Um, some of that difference will reflect real-world changes that we're not able to pick up in our census 2018 data set. There's been particular concern around the smoking variables, and that's, that's a real concern. A valid concern. However, some of that variability is simply that people don't always respond the same way. If you ask me to fill in a census form next week, I'll probably give you some different answers than the ones I gave before. Uh, religious affiliation is a little lower because um, there has been some change to the census question, which may have affected how people answered it. And you might think that using the secondary school or Qualifications variables is a bit odd. However, for anyone who's gained an, a higher qualification since 2013, we have that information from the uh, education data. So we're able to update their 2013 value if they've got a new qualification. So that is our 2013 census data and what we're using there. Um, and then we also are able to use some administrative data for some variables. This has been some work that we did have been doing for our census transformation program. There we've been looking at, can we use administrative data for census? We needed to understand which variables we were likely to have some good information for. So this is a, a summary diagram of how to present our findings from that work. We're using a quality framework for this, uh, so along the bottom is what we've called measurement error. So that's really consistency with the concept that we're trying to measure. So on the left hand side, there isn't much consistency with what we want. We call it poor and it progressively gets closer to what we're trying to measure. Uh, on the vertical axis we have covered, so that's how many people do we have this information for. So at the bottom, very few, right through uh, to almost everybody at the top. One of the main things from this is just the variety of places that different variables end up on, on this graph. What we're using for the 2018 census are variables where the measurement error is small. So the, the variables are close to what we're trying to, trying to measure. We don't need to worry about the coverage, uh, even if we're only able to fill in a small group of missing data uh, with good information, that, that's helpful. So uh, this is a bit of an abstract diagram, lots of lovely colours for those who like these things. Um, I am going back to the colours that we used uh, earlier. It's really just to say that it's complicated. We have census form information in the bright green form for all variables except one actually. Um, some variables we have admin sources for, some we have 2013 census, some both, some neither. Some variables we have item imputation for, and other variables we have to leave missing because we have no other sources. This is a picture of uh, questions or variables from the individual form 
with a breakdown by what source they've got. So each bar is a particular variable and if the green is the proportion of that subject population which has been available from the individual forms. It's ordered uh, by percent missing at the bottom and then the percentage of imputation. So at the top we have our uh, core demographic variables, so age, sex, uh, usual residence location and ethnicity where there's no missing data, there's very little imputation and most of the um, data comes from either the census forms, administrative data and or this 2018 census. So that's our core demographic counts. Uh, the, as we go down from there there's increasing amounts of imputation being used because we don't have so much available from other sources. And at the bottom, we see the increasing amounts of missing data. Uh, again, there's no imputation available here and decreasing amounts of information available from other sources. Second from the bottom, you'll see a dark green line. That's usual residence five years ago, where we had planned not to ask that question. There's a lot of address questions being asked in the census. So we did not ask that one because we can link back to the person's 2013 census response and then we'll know where they were five years ago. So that is the variables where we have some other sources or um, imputation being used for them. There's another group of variables where we don't have other, other ways of supplementing the sense information from the census forms. A lot of these are actually the activity limitations from the new disability questions and you can see that most of them have uh, just under 85%, between 80 and 85% of information available from the census individual forms and the rest is missing. And at the bottom we see that e iwi affiliation is worse than the other variables. Um, there's a lot of missing data from the iwi for iwi and the government statistician has um, made some decisions about that that Adele will talk about late, later, but that's why. So now I'm going to hand over to Adele to talk about the impact of those patterns of information for variables. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> um, so I'm going to finish the characteristics session uh, and summarise the methods and then talk to you a little bit about quality assurance and assessment. We'll talk about our quality management strategy shortly but it's important to mention now that uh, a key aspect of our quality management is that all variables are given a priority level. This is so that we can determine the relative importance of each variable and ensure that we focus our effort across the census program in the right places. Variables are rated as either priority one, two or three. The priority one variables are listed on the right side of your screen. They include our population and dwelling counts, core demographics, so age, sex, ethnicity, Maori descent and location. The method slides that we've shown you to date show that we have good coverage and quality for our priority one variables. Producing these variables to a high quality achieves a lot of the value of the purpose of running a census. The only priority one variable that we wanted to mention to you today was ethnicity. Ethnicity is a hierarchical classification and most of our standard outputs are produced at either level one or level four of that classification. Level one includes the broad ethnic groups, European, Maori, Pacific, Asian and Mila, Middle East and Latin American and African. That's used in a lot of our core cross tabulations. More detailed investigations sometimes occur at level four where the specific ethnicities are. On the uh, graph that Christine has just shown you, ethnicity is the fourth row on this graph. You can see that the majority of the information comes from census responses, then we have some information that comes from our 2013 census data, and then in the blue there's a segment that comes from administrative responses. 
When we get to the stage of using ethnicity data from administrative sources, it comes from three different sources. Some of that information is available at level four of the ethnicity classification, but some is only available at level two and three of the classification, which means that the very specific ethnicities are not there in some instances. There's a lot of variety in terms of the information at level two and three across the ethnicity classification. So if you have an interest in this area, it's really important that you look at the classification and understand it, and therefore understand that there may be some impact on some categories. Now we'd like to talk a little bit about missing data. We've already mentioned that when there are no high quality alternative sources and no feasible approaches for imputation, that there's a higher proportion of missing valuable values than for other variables or for previous censuses. This can be a little problematic for our 2018 variables that are new. If there's no alternative source and no ability to impute, obviously there's no information from 2013 that we can draw through as well. So this will impact some of our variables such as usual residence one year ago, disability and activity limitations, and our new housing quality variables, so damp, mould and access to amenities. Now I'd like to talk about our Māori variables. As we've discussed, there was no mitigation for non-response for most variables in the 2013 census. And we know that the characteristics of those who respond are not necessarily the same as the characteristics of those who do not respond. The impact is therefore greater on some data in some parts of the population. For example, the post-enumeration survey from the 2013 census showed that the net undercount for the Māori ethnic group was 6.1%. This compared with 1.9% for the European ethnic group or 2.4% for the total population. No mitigation for Māori descent or ethnicity in previous censuses is therefore going to have led to an undercount of those populations. By introducing mitigation in alternative sources in the 2018 census, we now have better coverage for the Māori descent and Māori ethnic populations than we did in 2013. Unfortunately, the news isn't so good for iwi. The lower than anticipated levels of participation in the 2018 census have resulted in a significant proportion of iwi showing a decline in affiliation that was not consistent with our expectations. Our ability to fill the gaps in this missing data is limited, and this is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there's a lack of coverage and quality of iwi administrative data. And secondly, there have been significant classification changes. Between the 2013 and 2018 censuses, there was a major review of our iwi statistical standard and classification. This resulted in 35 additional iwi being added to the classification that was used for the 2018 census. These changes mean that it's very complex to try and use the 2013 data to help repair or mitigate uh, the 2018 census responses. This is because the uh, additional iwi that were added to the classification were not part of the information that we tried to collect. They weren't on our, on our help notes or information to guide people as they responded in 2013. So we can't assume that those counts are representative for the use in 2018. As a consequence of these factors, the government uh, statistician has decided that iwi counts will not be released as official statistics from the 2018 census. And she's noted this as a significant loss. The decision was supported by our external data quality panel. We'll be, we will be working in partnership with iwi and Māori to find solutions to Māori data needs. This includes exploring options for the provision of non-official iwi data. That is, we are still likely to make iwi information available, it just may not be as an official statistic. Next I'd like to talk about families and households. Christine talked earlier about the fact that some admin enumerations have been added to dwellings and that some have not. You'll remember that the lowest geographic level that we're able to add those individuals to is a mesh block. Because families and households are derived at a dwelling level, the administrative enumerations that have only been added to a mesh block 
will be missing from the derivation of families and households. We saw earlier that this applies to around 357,000 people and will therefore result in some families and households being either missing or incomplete. This is a key area of investigation for our evaluations team who are building an understanding of this and of any other factors that may also impact the quality of our family and household data. So I'd like to summarise the two method sections that we've had so far. Alternative sources add real value to the census data set where they are available. The information we've been able to share with you today, particularly the graphs, shows that there's a significant benefit to a range of variables, especially, but not limited to, our priority one variables. At this stage in the New Zealand context, there are variables uh, where the only place we can get the information is from our census forms. The variables in this instance cannot be mitigated or replaced via administrative data. So EB was a prime example of that. Our strength, both for the 2018 census and going forward, comes from having a combination of both census forms and administrative data. Reduction in response rates and missing information from within forms have been a particularly significant issue for the 2018 census, but they've also been impacting our data quality increasingly for some time. The best quality census data going forward will be achieved through a combined approach of field collected and administratively, administratively sourced data. Now I'd like to move to talking about quality assurance and assessment. The presentation that we've given you so far highlights that data quality is not consistent across all variables. It's therefore important that we understand the needs of our customers, that we have a means of prioritising our effort as we develop, collect, process and disseminate data, and that we have a clear and structured way to communicate data quality for each variable to you, our customers. In order to do this, we have a quality management strategy. The 2018 Quality Management Strategy is available from the Stats New Zealand website for anyone who requires more detail than we can present today um, or if you just need some additional bedtime reading. The Quality Management Strategy outlines a number of dimensions that contribute to quality. The three that we are focusing on at this point in our census cycle are accuracy, consistency and, relevant, uh, sorry, consistency and coherence and interpretability. These are the things that are intri intrinsic to our data quality assurance processes that are currently being implemented across the census. As mentioned earlier, the priority one variables include our counts and our core demographics. Priority two variables include things such as uh, qualifications, iwi, income, work and labour force status and families and households. Our priority three variables include topics such as religion, disability or activity limitations, smoking, and our housing quality variables. The quality of census variables can be affected by a number of factors. The first is missing data, when there's no alternative source and no statistical imputation. This will result in bias and impact distributions when non-responders are different to responders such as the example we mentioned earlier with Māori descent and Māori ethnicity. It will also result in counts or levels for a variable being too low. The quality of data will be impacted when we use alternative sources as well. It's therefore very important that we make sure that we understand the quality of the 2013 census data we plan to use, of our administrative values and of any imputation. And finally, Variables will be impacted by the quality of received responses. If a variable is answered poorly, if it had design issues, or if there's issues in our processing system, the quality will be impacted. Over time, we've tried to increase and improve the information we make available regarding the quality of census data. In 2013, 
this resulted in the development of our first quality rating scale, where we formally and consistently provided a quality rating for each variable. Each variable had a quality rating of either very high, high, moderate, poor or very poor. In 2013, we had three metrics we used to produce these ratings. They were the level of non-response, the consistency with time series and other sources, and data quality. If quality issues were observed in one metric, that brought the overall rating for the variable down. So for example, if the rating for consistency with time series and other data sources was moderate, but the rating for non-response or data quality was high, the overall rating for the variable would be moderate. Ratings for variables were published in our information by variable product on the website and that information is still available for you if you wish to go and have a look at it and refresh your memories on it. In 2013, most variables received a rating of either very high or high uh, with some moderate ratings. The only poor ratings were given to variables that had specific output categories with issues associated with them, such as civil unions, where the number of civil unions re reported by respondents is often higher than the actual number that have occurred in our population, or for some of the derived household outputs, such as household income and extended family household income. So moving on to the 2018 quality rating scale. For 2018, we wanted to retain consistency where we could with the 2013 uh, census quality rating scale. Uh, but we also obviously had to make adjustments to make sure that it reflected the changes in methodology that we have and the range of data quality that we're likely to observe. The main change that we've made is that what was on the left, the non-response metric, has been replaced by a new metric called data source and coverage. This results in a weighted score for each variable based on the proportion of census responses, administrative responses, 2013 census responses, any imputation, and how much missing information there is. And we'll show a couple of examples in a minute of how that works. The second and third metrics, consistency and data quality, will be assessed in the same manner as, as we uh, undertook previously in the 2013 census. Also, as was undertaken in 2013, the overall rating will be produced by taking the lowest rating received across the three metrics. For 2018, we will be publishing the ratings, uh, both in terms of the overall rating, but also the individual ratings for each metric, so that you can fully see how we have assessed the quality for each variable. Now for the examples. So both of these examples use individual form responses. The first example is where we have been able to mitigate some non-response with additional sources. So this variable is sourced from census individual forms, historic 2013 census data, admin data and imputation. You can see in the second column there that there is a rating for each source. You'll be able to see, for example, that individual forms are, sourced at, uh, are rated at a 1, Historic 2013 census information for this variable has been rated at 0.95. The 2013 census source uh, data comes from the table that Christine showed you previously. Um, and so that is where we have uh, undertaken a comparison of the 2013 18 and 18 responses where people have answered both censuses. The rating for administrative data uh, comes from the work that our census transformation program has undertaken during the assessments of determining which variables are suitable uh, for inclusion. Uh, and in terms of imputation, uh, the rating is based on the quality of the source information uh, that is used for the imputation. For this variable, you can see that it has resulted in an overall score of 0.973. If we go back to the previous slide, you'll see that in our data sources and coverage uh, table there on the left, that results in this variable getting a score of high. In our second example here from an individual form, there has been no means of mitigating the variable. So uh, the table that is presented only shows individual form source data and missing or non-response information. That's re resulted in an overall score of 0.84, which means a rating of poor. 
what we're trying to make sure uh, that you know from the information we're providing here is that we are going to be totally transparent about the sources of information for each variable and what impact that has had on the quality for it. And we will be making all of this information available at the point of first release in September. So what does all of this mean for output and dissemination of our data? At the moment, our evaluation process is still ongoing now that all the administrative enumerations have been included in the data set. Our focus has been on ensuring we can produce a high quality count that meets the needs of our key customers. Our focus has been on our priority one variables on EWI and we've been able to provide a clear signal of the quality for those variables. Decisions to restrict or not output any further variables will be guided by the data evaluation work that we've been talking about and the use of the quality rating scale that we've just presented. Any at-risk variables will then undergo further investigations and go through a thorough risk and assessment process before any decision is made. If any further output variables are to be restricted, we will communicate this as soon as we can with the intent of doing this by the end of July. What I'm going to do now is hand back over to Cathy to talk a little bit about 2023. Two real people, as in, I know you're real people out there, but <laughs> to, to a live audience. Um, so we are considerably faster when we don't have uh, questions. So um, we will have plenty of time for question time, and who knows, you may even get a bit of time back in your day. So um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, 2023. So although we are still working our way through 2018, I'm very focused on that. Um, censuses never sleep and we do uh, need to kick off our work around 2023. So every census we go to government to request funding for the programme. Normally uh, we would have asked for the budget to deliver the next five years worth of the programme um, for this year. So um, with this time we've taken a different approach uh, to seeking the funding for 2023 because we really need to understand what worked and what didn't work and the independent review um, is going to be a really important part of that. So instead this year we applied for one year's worth of funding um, to complete to both complete the 2018 and to start 2023. Uh, the Prime Minister and Minister Shaw announced last week um, that that funding will be made available in the 2019 budget. Um, so what that means is that this year, as in this calendar year, um, we will need to complete the business case in the budget bid to be submitted in December 2019. Um, what oh, I'll just do all the all of the building of the slide there. Um, what we do understand about 2023 is that we we, we need to work differently, um, and we need to partner um, if we're going to deliver a, a successful 2023 census. We're really really looking for that uh, to be an inclusive census, um, both in terms of the way that we uh, collect information, but also um, just all the way through. So we will um, extend an invitation to any interested party who are um, interested in being involved, where it matters to you, where it's relevant. So um, we will be running a few workshops on different topics over the next few months. So if you are interested, we'll extend, extend a, an invitation and you're welcome to, to join us. Um, so when is the next information coming? Um, you'll hear from us next this um, webinar. We will send out a link to all of you who did register. Um, and the, the link will also be available on Lumio, which is the, um, the tool that we use to interact. And we will be uh, using again to interact over the next wee while. So if you're not on Lumio um, and you would like to be, please get in touch. You can use our... Um, census uh, standard um, email address and that will come through to uh, Sophie who will <laughs> action all of that and make sure that you get access to that um, 
to that forum. Um, in terms of about 2018 census, as um, Adele has mentioned, we will provide an update to our customers on the quality of variables. Um, this will come via our usual uh, mechanisms, the Census Advisory Newsletter, the Lumio engagement, and where we know that variables are critical for particular customers, we will endeavour to have some face-to-face -face meetings as well, so we can talk that through with you. Um, we will be at the PANS uh, conference in June. Uh, there probably won't be a whole lot of new information there, so if you are a PANS attendee, probably don't expect to see um, a whole lot more than what we've already talked about. Um, and obviously we mentioned the independent review, that will be released by the end of July, so um, you'll, you'll get more information about what worked and what didn't work then. And as I mentioned, 2023, um, we will be in touch to provide you with an opportunity if you are interested to be involved. Okay, so that ends our presentation to you. Um, we know we have got a few questions that have come through. Um, please, so we'll start um, to answer them. Adele and Christine will join me now. Um, and uh, if you are, um, if you are interested uh, in asking some more questions, please send them through. Um, we've got uh, Teresa and Mike uh, waiting eagerly to <laughs> receive any questions, which they'll flick through to us. Um, so we have got a couple. Um, the first one was around uh, roughly what percentage of the Māori population will be drawn from census data and what percentage from administrative data. So we've given you that 89 and 11 at that total level. Um, I'm afraid we haven't got the Māori data um, for, I, for either descent or ethnicity to hand, but this is not the first time we've been asked that question. We understand that that's important for us to be able to um, to release, so we will be um, providing that information um, once we've pulled it together. Just takes a little bit of time to, to work that through. Um, so where you have data from both census and administrative data, have you compared how often they match? And if so, how does that comparison show? So I'm pleased to say the answer to that is a yes, um, in some instances anyway, and I'll pass to Christine to answer that question. So the diagram that we had with, uh, we call it the bubble diagram with the, all the blue circles, um, that, that represents the work that we've done comparing the 2013 census to the 2013 administrative data. So we have all the information about how consistent people were in 2013. Uh, right now we are running the comparisons for people who've responded in 2018 versus the people that we would be using administrative data for in 2018. So that work, that's in progress, clearly we've only just got that information, um, but it's been based off the 2013 comparisons. Great, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, what other countries use a combined census? So I don't have a, a big list in my head, but I, I'll mention a couple of countries. Uh, Germany, um, they switched to a census that's largely based on their provincial or lander um, population registers and as well as a housing survey I think and a sample survey for characteristics. Um, Holland has um, uses their registers uh, for most of their census but also combines it with their labour force survey and other household surveys for variables that aren't in the registers. And there are a number of other countries that I can't <laughs> recall off the top of my head. Okay so hopefully that gives you some idea. Um, Given that there were issues with data collection in Census 2018, was there any consideration to do an early census to get back into the pre-Christchurch earthquake census cycle? So that would be um, going to a 2021 um, cycle. And yes, we did consider it, but um, where the, yeah, this a census is a big program of work. It takes five to six years to, to run a census and um, we did seriously consider whether we thought it would be an option but we just do not believe that we could run a successful census in 2021. So um, 2023 is, um, is when we're planning to run the next census. So. Um, Okay, how comparable is the 2018 data set with previous years? 
uh, StatsNZ usually re-releases two earlier censuses on new geography each time. Is this happening? So that's referring to rebasing and we mm -hmm. will be undertaking rebasing again and uh, at the point that data becomes available we will have the historical data there for comparative purposes. Was there a first bit of the question? Uh, well? Yeah, I can probably answer that. So um, I guess you're talking about the time series consistency and I guess there's a few things that's probably worth us commenting on there. Um, we did change a number of things this census um, and, and we changed some questions as well which, um, which always impacts on, on the time series. Um, we did make a decision uh, pre, um, pre the collection period to also um, introduce imputation for quite a number of variables, that's something that we haven't done in the past. So that again would uh, introduce a discontinuity. Um, and the other thing is we obviously, um, you know, given that the participation rate hasn't been nearly as high as we hoped, and through the use of administrative data, this introduces quite a different approach. So that is obviously going to introduce discontinuities as well. So um, I think it's one of the things we're always weighing up, isn't it, Cathy, is that it's that balance of um, consistency versus quality. Mm -hmm. And the decision that we made at the point that we decided that we would use um, administrative data, historical data and imputation for missing responses in the census was because we believed it would bring better quality data to our customers. So it will have an impact on time series. But we're doing that with the intention that it's going to bring better quality. Mm. We certainly hope so. So I don't think we've got any more questions that have come through. No, so if anybody has two minutes, we'll give you two minutes to, so what do we, we have to stand here, sorry, we're, <laughs> we're entertained, okay, so we'll just um, give a little bit longer <laughs> to, if you do have any questions that you want to, to come through. Um, I think that's just so our colleagues can watch us sweat for a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, I think so, so. I'd have to say this is all our first uh, experience doing a webinar, so... Um, so thank you for being our first yes. audience. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's been, we hope it's worked okay from you. And uh, on that note, if you have got any feedback that you want to provide us, um, we, would, we would love to hear from you. Um, has this forum worked? Um, if it has, it's something that we could look at um, using again. If not, um, then... Uh, it's helpful yeah. to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very helpful to know. So, um, this question, how big was the difference between the 2013 and the 2018 responses? So, um, I mean, we haven't, uh, until we run our uh, post-enumeration, so we've, we've collected the data from our post-enumeration survey, but to deliver the results around census coverage, we need to process that fully, and that relies on having a, um, a uh, completed census data set. So that work um, will, is still to happen, and I mentioned that the results of that will be published uh, by March 2020. Um, so that's, it's only then that we will get our true estimate of the, um, of the coverage rate and the response rate. Um, so I think, you know, we've talked to you about our estimations um, of, our, of our coverage rate anyway, um, and we've estimated it based off our best uh, guess, if you like, um, of uh, the 2018 total using the revised ERP and that um, you know, aligns very well with our estimate using the dual system estimation as well. And that's come in at 1.2%, which compared to the equivalent um, rate for 2013 of 2.4%. So, so we're obviously very encouraged by that. We don't know that that's exactly where it's going to land and, and until we've done the census coverage survey and worked that through, that's when we'll have our official results around that. Okay, um, how does imputation work? <laughs> I think that's a, <laughs> there's probably not a quick answer to that, but um, do you want to? Uh, so just briefly, there's some variables that usually, if we're going to impute a, a variable like um, uh, ethnicity, for example, then uh, we'll have a number of other variables that are related to ethnicity. 
Some of that's just age or sex because ethnicity varies by that, but also we'll have birthplace or um, language or uh, Maori descent or things like that that are related to the variable that you want to impute. And it's, a, it's effectively a prediction model based on the variables that you have. Uh, we use a particular software that's um, been developed by Statistics Canada that, uh, to get technical, that uses uh, a nearest neighbour uh, donor imputation. So it's a, it's a statistical process where you've, you find the, mo the most similar person um, to the person who got, who's got missing data and then borrow the missing values from them. So it's a statistical process that gives us our best prediction. We don't use it unless we think we can get a good prediction of, of what the true value might have been. Okay, uh, I can answer the next one. When will the 2018 census data be published? So the first data will be released on the 23rd of September later this year and from there we will flow with um, uh, a usual um, range of products uh, through to um, mid-2020. Okay, another question. Is it likely that any variables will be released only at broader geographic levels? e.g. available for territorial authorities but not SA2s or SA1s? Or if it is released, will it be an all or nothing level? So that's a really good question and we still are actually working through how we do that. Um, what we can say is that uh, whatever we do release, we will make sure that we have got a lot of metadata available so that you can understand the quality of it. And Adele talked to you through some of the tools that we'll be using to, um, to provide that. Um, so I guess it is possible um, that we may only release some data at higher geographies, but certainly wherever we can, we will be looking to release it at that finer level. So um, it'll only be if we, we think that the quality is um, really, uh, you know, no, no good. Yeah. 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 And I guess that's because too, we, we want to make sure that if the, level, if the quality is good enough at those higher levels, then we would want to make sure that we made that information available, which is why it wouldn't be an all or nothing approach. Like yeah, if, if the quality is good enough, we will make it available. If it's not, then we will have to go through a process of, of assessing what our options are. Yeah, yeah. But and everybody, every person is placed in a mesh block, so it's, there's yeah. the potential to release all yes. information at, yes. at statistical area one level. Yeah, and that's certainly what we'll be aiming to do. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the distribution of admin people records? Is it evenly spread across the country or concentrated in certain areas? I guess the thing that I would just say, and then I'll hand over to Christine for <laughs> probably the, the more technical answer, is we have, um, we know, and I'm sure uh, you, a lot of you who are, um, you know, active users of census will understand that um, Historically, we have had challenges in some particular locations, uh, Northland, East Cape, in particular South Auckland, and again, we have experienced challenges in those areas. Um, this census, we also have more of an everywhere missingness on top of um, the, the usual challenges that we have. Um, so, so I guess it's, the answer to that question is almost both yes. Um, no, I think that's a good answer, Cathy. I probably okay. I don't have the detail to answer more, but mm -hmm. there is a, there will be administrative enumerations across the country, but they will there will be more of them where, where we have lower yep. responses. Okay. Uh, here's another question, which I might actually look at Mike to, to answer. I'm not sure. Is there a release date for the census dictionary? We need this to get our custom data order in the queue. Right, for custom, yes, okay. So we'll so, make that available at the same point that we start uh, processing customised requests. Yep. Um, Which we hope to be uh, soon after the 23rd of September. Yeah, we do, certainly do. Um, and I guess if that's going to cause a problem for anybody, just get in touch with our um, customer team and they'll um, try and help you as much as they can. Um, what advice can you give on creating trend data for spatial areas such as census uh, unit at, I presume it's at unit and mesh block level? Area unit. Um, 
oh sorry, area unit in Mishblock level, how to compare the smaller 2013 data set to the 2018 um, data. So there's a number of questions there. So creating trend data for spatial areas such as census area unit and mesh block level. That might be a question that we don't have the expertise to. Well, um, well, and I think it's going to go it. depend which variables you, you're working with. So I think it might be a case of having to work. I think it might be quite complicated. Mm. Yeah. Well, it will be quite complicated. Um, the first thing perhaps to say is that we're, we have new geographies now. So there won't be any area unit or mesh block data released. Instead, we have new statistical geographies called SA1 and SA2. Mm -hmm. SA, SA2 are roughly equivalent to area units, um, so suburbs or small towns, but they have been created in a way that's good for statistical analysis, so that there's a fairly even distribution of size, for example, and they, we've tried to represent communities of interest better than in the past. Um, the SA1 uh, geographies are smaller. They are replacing our mesh block outputs. The SA1s are, again, a better statistical unit for producing information. There, there are no tiny mesh blocks that will have to... It's tiny SA1s. Uh, the, there's a minimum size, and they do try and represent uh, communities of interest better than the mesh blocks as well. So there should be a, different, uh, a better geography for statistical analysis, and are we creating previous census data on those geographies? Yes, yes we are. Yep. So on the geographies themselves, we'll have um, a time series of the same areas. Uh, in terms of time series for different variables, I think there will be uh, some interesting and difficult issues perhaps to, yes. to work through because of the changes. Okay, when will custom data requests be processed and released? So Adele just mentioned that. That's going to be as soon after the 23rd of September as, as we can. Um, the travel to work variable, is it's travel in the census week, so how can that be imputed from surveys, etc.? It's imputed from the responses that have been provided on other census forms. Yep. So anything that we've um, imputed is, is from data that we obtained in 2018 and, and using the information we have about the person to find somebody similar. Uh, what impact did the loss of Statistics House following the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake have on the 2018 census just run 15 months later? Look, this is something that um, the independent review will be touching on. So. Um, I don't think I can uh, say anything useful right now, but certainly that will um, that will be considered as part of part of that part of that review. So that is um, due, it's an independent review, um, and it is due out uh, in July. So the, and it is on track to to be released. So um, expect to to hear more about that there. Um, would the quality of data, very good, good, etc., for variables be released for each of the TLAs, regions, or at a national level? That's a great question, and again, one that we've had before. And I think that's something that we'll need to be working through with our products and services team. Um, it's um, a change that we've had this time, so we will have to work with that and work out the best way of making that information available to you. We don't want to overwhelm you by providing so much metadata that it's actually hard to hard to use it, but at the same time we need to make sure that there's enough and so we're going to have to think about how we present that information at lower geographies. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, we haven't got any more um, questions I think at this point. Um, so uh, again, we'd really appreciate your thought on how the webinar went. Um, so a link will be sent out for you to provide some, some feedback to us on that. Um, we certainly hope that it's been a useful um, session for you. Uh, and uh, thanks for attending. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Matewa.